Throughout history, ordinary citizens have driven scientific innovation simply by observing the world around them. As backyard astronomers, we gazed at the night sky, recorded our observations, and helped to map the galaxy. Anton von Leeuwenhoek, a Dutch draper, in an effort to better understand the fabric with which he was working, created the microscope. In doing so, he opened up a window to a microscopic world which, until that point, had not yet been seen. Like the many citizen scientists before us, we all have deep within us a curiosity that drives us to pursue an understanding of the natural world. As scientists, we're taught that in order to ask questions and seek answers, we have to go through rigorous academic training. We're taught that in order to bring a scientific idea to fruition, we have to do it for power, prestige, or profit. I disagree. I am a citizen scientist. I left my job in the biotech industry in October of 2012. I moved from San Francisco to West Oakland and began working in a community of artists and creative thinkers. During this time, I read an article about the emergence of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. For those of you who don't know, antibiotic-resistant bacteria are bacteria that have evolved the mechanisms to become immune to the therapies we use to treat them. You may have heard of MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. This hospital-born pathogen infects 94,000 people each year and kills the equivalent of 2.2% of San Francisco's population annually. The article described how gonorrhea is slowly following in the footsteps of MRSA. What used to be treatable with a single dose of third-generation antibiotic now requires multiple doses of the same antibiotic. These third-generation antibiotics are the last line of defense in treating gonorrhea. Effectively, what we've done is create a series of tools to treat infectious diseases that are becoming unsustainable. These antibiotic-resistant infections cost the healthcare industry $20 billion annually, yet we still continue to pour hundreds of millions of dollars into developing new antibiotics, which again, become unsustainable. After reading this article, I became really excited. Excited in only the way a citizen scientist can be excited after reading an article on antibiotic-resistant bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> I contacted my friend and colleague, Amy, and we began troubleshooting the problem. It didn't take us long to realize that industry was missing a very important and effective uh, potential therapy. This therapy is bacteriophage therapy. Bacteriophage are viruses that infect bacteria. They are of the most abundant life forms on the planet. It's estimated that, that there are 10 to 16 bacteriophage per bacterial species. These bacteriophage infect their hosts specifically. That is, a bacteriophage isolated from gonorrhea is unlikely to infect a, a, a strain of E. coli or salmonella. When these bacteriophage infect their hosts, they inject their genetic material into the cell and turn that bacteria into a virus-producing factory. When enough phage is produced, these viruses release from the cell, killing the bacterial cell. They enter into the periphery and go on to infect other bacterial hosts. As a therapy, bacteriophage can be isolated from bacteria and given back to a patient. In the Republic of Georgia, they're doing this now in a personalized medicine approach. What that looks like is a sick patient goes into the clinic, they're swabbed for their bacterial infection, whether that's the throat or the lung or cultures are taken from the blood. The bacteriophage are isolated from those bacteria and given back to the patient. This is a really effective therapy. In 1936 in Los Angeles, this therapy was used to eradicate typhoid fever. There was an outbreak it reduced the mortality rate from 20% to 2%. The question is, with these therapies being so effective, why is industry today not investing in phage therapy research? Well, it turns out that as institutions, academia and industry are flawed. They're held back by conventional thought and hierarchy and driven by competition and profit. They've turned the pursuit of science into the pursuit of intellectual property. 
In the case of bacteriophage, these viruses mutate quickly. So from an intellectual property perspective, they're hard to claim ownership of. What that means is no intellectual property equals no profit equals no research. Citizen science hopes to alleviate these problems by opening up science to a broader community of individuals. In the 19th century, citizen science was um, institutionalized. We saw a transition from the individual to institutions like academia, industry, and government. As a pushback to this, second wave citizen scientists of the 1970s started forming partnerships with institutions. We saw a return of the citizen scientists to their backyard as an astronomer working with NASA. Unfortunately, this slight opening up of the institutions was not enough to bring people back into science in a big way. Today, we see a third generation of citizen scientists emerging. They're armed with a sense of stewardship, social responsibility, accountability, integrity, and focus. They have a knowledge of complex scientific tools and are taking on leadership roles in addressing complex scientific problems. These citizen science organizations are popping up around the world. In New York, GenSpace is a 501c3 certified nonprofit. They are conducting high quality research, ecological research, and offering educational programs to the community. UBiome, the microbiome project, they are working to map the human microbiome. The microbiome is the uh, series of bacteria that live in and on people. As a citizen scientist myself, I am focused on the gonorrhea eradication team and integration task force. Get it. <laughs> Our primary focus is to create open source therapies for antibiotic resistant bacteria. We are currently in the process of seeking our 501c3 status, and we are forming partnerships with local clinics to better track the emergence of antibiotic resistant gonorrhea. We have a long term goal of creating a decentralized network of scientists focused on the same issue that will pool their data and allow us to better track the emergence of this pathogen. We're also focused on creating an educational outreach program. We plan on bringing people from the community into our lab and teaching them how to perform molecular biological experiments. Though I believe this decentralized grassroots approach to conducting science is effective at broadening the diversity of voices in the scientific arena, it has its challenges. It turns out when people are involved, these things have challenges. One of these challenges is the training bias. Many people believe that as citizen scientists, we should not have access to the tools, chemicals, or microorganisms we need to do our work. Many people fear that as citizen scientists, we may inadvertently create the next bioweapon. I'd like to point out that the last bioterrorist attack in the US was reportedly perpetrated by a military microbiologist. To address the challenges, we do not need to limit access to the resources. We need to create a value system around which citizen science can be performed. Another challenge we've had is finding people who believe that this is possible. On our team, we actually had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about whether or not we should allow a PhD or have a PhD on our board just to lend credibility to our organization. This was a heated debate, <laughs> still is. Um, we believe that if people are dedicated and committed to conducting research, no matter what their credentials are, they should have the opportunity to do that. Throughout this debate, we've come out stronger. We've centered on a very strong set of values. We value open access research, transparency. We value accountability, integrity, and community collaboration. By bringing these values back into science, we're opening up the door for more people to participate in scientific discourse. We're broadening the avenues through which the ordinary citizen can reclaim their place in science. If you share in these values, I urge you to participate in your local citizen science movement. Ask questions, seek answers. Your voice is an integral part in understanding our natural world. 
No matter what your background, whether it's science or music, your creativity and curiosity can change the world. Thank you. <laughs>